Thank you uh, very much, uh, everyone, for making it this evening. Uh, I don't intend to uh, give Ed a long introduction uh, because I'm sure that uh, all of you know who he is and, and are keen to, to hear what he has to say. Uh, Ed is the Fred and Elega Eleanor Glimp Professor of Economics at Harvard, where he also serves as the director of the Taubman Center for State and Local Government and the Rappaport Institute for Greater Boston. He also uh, has had time to uh, do some of the world's uh, leading research on uh, cities uh, and to write a book, uh, which he is here uh, to talk about this evening, uh, Triumph of the City, How Our Greatest Invention Makes Us Richer, Smarter, Greener, Healthier and Happier. And uh, I'm pleased to say that the book will be available for sale uh, outside. This is your chance to get ahead of the crowds because it's not released in London uh, until Friday. Uh, so with no more ado, over to you, Ed. Thank you, uh, thank you all very, very much for, for coming. I, I, uh, that's actually the, the, the U.S. cover, but uh, this, is, this is the U.K. one. The U.S. one is, of course, Chicago stretched out, but because uh, you can't have a New York, uh, New York cover in the U.S. because it seems too East Coast uh, in, in the States. Um, let me start actually far away from New York and uh, far away from, from Chicago and far away from London, and let's start in Tahrir Square in, in Cairo. It's been called the Facebook revolution, and there's no doubt that new technologies helped to make this happen. There's no doubt that executives at Google helped to, to, helped to topple Hosni Mubarak. But this change wouldn't have happened if people had just stayed home and blocked Mubarak from their Facebook pages. They actually needed to take to the streets. They actually needed to go to the city to effect change. And this reminds us that despite globalization new technologies, that cities are still places where the, the path of history is formed. They're still places where things can either go well, and we can actually once again have those, those ancient words, Stadt Luft macht frei, city air makes you free, or in fact something much darker may come out of this change. But whatever, whatever path history takes, it is being made on, in the cities of the Middle East as we, as we speak. Indeed, this fact helps make the, illustrate, I think, the broader paradox that lies at the heart of, heart of the book, which is that we live in an age in which communication and transportation costs have vanished away to nothingness, in which it is effortless, to, easy to effortlessly telecommunicate across the globe, in which we could all, you know, just dial it in from whatever sylvan spot appeals to our biophilia. And yet, throughout the world, we still cluster in cities more than ever, right? We've just passed that momentous halfway point where more than half of the planet now lives in urban areas. We see urban resurgence in the developed world where cities like London and New York and Chicago look very different from the cities of the 1970s, which looked like they were headed in, into permanent decline. In the developing world, the role of cities is even more, more striking as we see places like Bangalore, which are you know, pathways out of poverty into prosperity for the developing world. If you, you look across countries, and this is the relationship, of course, between urbanization and income across countries, there, there, there's, no, you know, there's no such thing as a poor urbanized country. There's no such thing as a rich rural country. If you compare those countries that are more than 50% urbanized to those countries that are less than 50% urbanized, the income levels in the more urban countries are more than five times higher, and the infant mortality rates are one-third in the more urbanized countries. It doesn't mean that you necessarily want to squeeze more people into the cities by force in those areas, but certainly urbanization is an important part of the development process. Gandhi famously said that the future of India was in its, in its villages, but how can that possibly look right today? The future of India is not in its, its villages, not in the places of, of unending rural poverty, but it's in the places like Bangalore. They're places that are connectors across countries and continents. You know, from a, from a U.S. perspective, from a U.K. perspective, Bangalore may feel like this place on the edge of, edge of nowhere, a place that you call and magically your software glitches get fixed by some wise person on the other end of the phone. Of course, from an Indian perspective, it's nothing like that. It's the quintessence of proximity. It's a place that is massed in places like the Mind Tree campus in Bangalore, which is the slick uh, place on, the, on, the, uh, on your left. The places where young, smart software engineers come to learn from each other and to get smart and to become productive. And you know, it's places where the, the, outs the outside area is the messier world of Bangalore outside the Mind Tree campus. And there are places where people who are less skilled come to connect with them and get some sort of more indirect connection uh, with the globalizing world. 
The, the role of these cities in the developing world and the success of cities like London in the developed world really requires us, I think, to rethink our world and to rethink preconceived notions about how cities are decaying or corrupt and, or that the, and that the, the dreams of, of whatever country can only exist behind a, a fence and a cottage. Cities are really unbelievably dynamic, important, productive places, and they deserve policies that treat them well. Now, the role of cities in terms of being conduits of ideas across countries and continents is not something that's new. It's at least 2,500 years old. The top picture, of course, is Raphael's School of Athens which is depicting the remarkable coming together of minds 2,500 years ago in that great city. Athens, much like New York in the middle of the 20th century, was flush with military success and, com and commercial, uh, commercial dominance. It attracted the best minds of the Greek diaspora throughout the Mediterranean world. People like the, the philosophers who came to teach Socrates, people like the father of, of urban planning, Hippodamus, Hippodamus, who came in from Miletus, a remarkable influx of talent that then connected with the people of Athens and created these chains of, of collaborative creativity that are cities at their best. The bottom line shows Nagasaki, which was the port of entry for originally Jesuit and then Dutch learning into Japan. Right? The Japanese consolidated the Dutch in one, in one city in order to limit foreign influences, but as a result they create an easy place for people to come and actually get a, a, get a quick onrush of all of, uh, of, all of knowledge in, in these areas. Um, this, this process of cities being chains, of uh, being connectors across continents still goes on to this day. It's not in any sense being depleted by new technologies. And I think the reason why cities are becoming more, not less important with globalization and new technologies is that what the, these things are doing is they're increasing the returns to being smart. They're increasing the returns to new innovation. Because now you can make it on the other side of the planet, you can sell it on the other side of the planet. You can, you know, the, the, the ideas are getting more complicated than ever. And we are at our heart. Our greatest asset is our ability to learn from people around us. We're a social species that comes out of the womb with this remarkable ability to soak up information. Anyone here who has taught knows the hard part about teaching is not expounding your material. It's not delivering the message from on high. It's figuring out whether or not your audience gets it. It's actually figuring out whether or not the words that are coming pouring out of your mouth are actually making some imprint or actually getting across. And we have developed as a species a remarkable set of cues for signaling comprehension or confusion. We have just a remarkable ability to connect with each other when we're in the same room, when we're able to learn from one another. Cities help make that happen. Since we get smart from being around other smart people, the urban edge is actually bringing people together and enabling them to, to learn from each other, to create these collaborative chains uh, of invention that are responsible for humankind's greatest hits. And because ideas are more complicated than ever, we need that, the advantages that come from face-to-face -face contact uh, more than ever. That's why cities like New York and elsewhere have come, come back. That's why you see things like this enormous correlation between urban size and productivity across space, right? If the rest of the U.S. became as productive as the New York metropolitan area did on a per capita level, U.S. GDP would increase by 43%. That fact is even more true in the U.K., that if the U.K. rose to the productivity levels of, of, of London, right? An enormous, an enormous gap between, between, between cities and outside and non-urban areas. And that in itself is showing the power of density to actually create productivity. Now, this urban turnaround would have been surprising in the New York of my youth. So these are both two iconic images of, the, of New York City in the 1970s when I was a kid. So one of them is President Jimmy Carter wandering through the South Bronx, which looked like a bombed out wasteland during its time period. The bottom is his predecessor, President Ford, uh, being reported as telling New York City to drop dead. Uh, when, the, when they were seeking federal aid. Now, in truth, during that era, it was not just President Ford, not just Gerald Ford, but history itself that looked like it was telling New York to drop dead, right? The city looked like it was headed for the trash heap of, of history. The largest industrial cluster in the United States in the 1950s was not automobile production in Detroit. It was garment production in, in New York. And globalization, the death of distance, had killed that off, as it also did into manufacturing jobs in London, right? London lost something like 540,000 manufacturing jobs between 1961 and 1975, a huge decline in the employment base of, of this city, as New York experienced in the, in the decline of its industrial jobs. The, and that was entirely understandable, and it didn't at all look to anyone sitting in 1977 that New York was going to come back the way that it did. Now, it's not at all surprising that these changes 
destroyed, you know, destroyed the one-time manufacturing advantages of New York. Because if you think about it, all of America's older, colder cities had formed on a transportation network. They had been part of an attempt to make the wealth of the American hinterland accessible to the markets of the East and to Europe. In 1816, it cost as much to move goods 32 miles over land in the United States as to ship them across the Atlantic. As a result, all of America perched on the eastern seaboard, clinging to the lifeline that was the Atlantic Ocean. Over the course of the 19th century, uh, we pushed inland, we made investments, often with the help of British capital in things like the Erie Canal, the Illinois Michigan Canal, and of course the railroads that created a transportation node that made uh, American, the American farmland of Iowa, the great uh, uh, Ohio River Valley accessible and, and usable. The cities that formed in the U.S. were nodes on that transportation network. There were places like Chicago, which were a critical spot where the Illinois and Michigan Canal connected the Mississippi River through the Chicago River to the Great Lakes. It was a linchpin on a great watery arc that spanned all the way from New York to New Orleans. New York, of course, was the great end point, the point where the river met, met the sea, which, is, which was not at all unique. Every one of America's 20 largest cities in 1900 was on a major waterway. And then in cities like New York, industry formed around the port. So New York's three largest industries during the 19th century were sugar refining, printing and publishing, and the garment trade. Sugar refining, of course, was quite natural in New York. It was a place that did a lot of trade with the Caribbean, and you can't refine sugar crystals in the Caribbean during the 19th century because they would coalesce during a long, hot uh, ship journey north. Printing and publishing, of course, was in New York also because of the port. The big money in 19th century printing and publishing in, in the U.S. was, of course, printing pirated English novels. Right? We didn't. We didn't have any. any we didn't give any any copyright protection. And of course, the problem is with pirated English novels is you've got to publish first. So New York's port gave a great advantage to the nascent publishers like Har the Harper Brothers, who were able to get the latest copy of Peveril and the Peak before their Philadelphia competitors, Carrie and Lee, were able to. They were able to publish within a day and completely shut them out of the market because they had the port. And printing and publishing came up around that port. Similarly, the garment trade, for example, came, came up because of both the easy access to customers, but also because of the fabric that was coming through, uh, coming through New York during this time period. Chicago, of course. Chicago's great, great industries were both clothing manufacturing and the stockyards. You see the name of Armour down there. Armour was, was an example of someone who was not just a, a part of this network of making the, the corn of Iowa turned into pigs transported to the eastern markets. He was also an innovator, right? Armour actually is responsible for creating the, the refrigerated rail cars that made uh, refrigerated beef sh shippable uh, east. The great innovation, of course, was putting the ice on top instead of on the bottom, so it dripped down, keeping the cows colder, keeping the, the slaughtered beef colder for, for longer. Um, now, part of the magic of cities, of course, is that even when they form for mundane reasons, access to uh, the, the wheat fields of Chicago, they then are responsible for really remarkable innovations, and Chicago certainly saw one of those in the, in the 1880s. So there's a long debate in uh, the architectural history world about who the father of the skyscraper is. Customarily, pride of place is given to William LeBaron Jenny for his building, the Home Insurance Building. But there are problems with the Home Insurance Building story. The, the defining characteristics of the, of the skyscraper are, of course, a, a load-bearing steel or cast iron skeleton. Home Insurance only had two walls that had uh, steel-bearing uh, skeletons, and the other two were traditional masonry uh, load-bearing walls. And there were other innovators at the same time, Burnham, Sullivan, who were also engaged in this. Now, I think the point of that story is that, in fact, the very search for sole architect who was responsible for the skyscraper is misguided. The point is that the, that the skyscraper was a collective contribution, a collective creation of the city of Chicago that you have Jenny, you also have people who were working in Jenny's offices when they were young, like Daniel Burnham, like Louis Sullivan, like, um, and people like Holliburton and Roche, and of course, Roche, and of course the great uh, fireproofing engineer Peter B. White, all of whom were connecting with each other, all of whom were borrowing each other's ideas, collaborating and creating this, this idea. So it's sort of a chain of, of ideas that people borrowed from one another, and collectively they created this thing that makes city living much more feasible. Um, now, innovation is not particularly limited to Chicago during this area. Certainly one of the most innovative places on the planet a century ago was Detroit, not a place we customarily uh, associated with hot innovation and entrepreneurship today. But if you go back to 1900, Detroit was you know, an absolute seedbed of, of small firm creativity. And it, it 
gets in the car business in part because it brings together two industries. One of, that indus one of those industries is carriage making, and Billy Durant, the father of General Motors, is in the carriage business in, in Flint, Michigan, and, and also, though, of course, it has engines. Now, what you're seeing over here is the Detroit Dry Dock, uh, a company that, that catered to the inland uh, shipping trade on the Great Lakes, and it had innovative people like Frank Kirby who were involved in, in making engines there. Now, uh, the, this young gentleman, who is the young Henry Ford, uh, got his start training on engines in Detroit Dry Dock. Now, Ford then branched out on his own and was one of the many competitors, all of whom were trying to come up with a new, new thing in the end of the 19th and early 20th century in Chicago. So there's the Fisher brothers, the Dodge brothers, David Dunbar Buick, Ford himself, and, and Durant in nearby Michigan, and there are many, many more, all of whom are, are trying to copy each other's ideas, supply each other with parts, supply each other with financing. It's sort of a model of what a collective city uh, collective creative city can do. It's not surprising, right? Early, earlier ideas of the Industrial Revolution came through these urban chains. In this case, the, we're, you're of course looking at Arkwright and the earlier Lewis Paul uh, patent for a roller spinning device. And the creation of Arkwright's water frame comes out of a chain that starts with Lewis Paul and, and a guy called Wyatt, who was, who was a file engineer in, in Birmingham, then spreads through a chain that involves Thomas Hayes and John Kay and eventually makes its way to, to Arkwright, each person building on each other, each person riffing on, on, each other's, on each other's ideas until something really incredible is formed. Now, the problem with the Industrial Revolution from an urban perspective, which is, of course, also the problem of what Henry Ford did in Detroit, is that what these guys figured out was how to produce affordable clothing by doing it on a vast scale, by in doing it in factories. This is, of course, Arkwright's own mill, um, doing it in factories that were, in some sense, walled off from the outside world. Now, if you think back at what made cities successful in the 18th century, it's about smart people, small firms, and connections to the outside world. Right? This is what the Birmingham of the 1770s looks like, or the London of the 1770s, what New York in the age of Alexander Hamilton looks like. But you move forward to the Manchester of the mid-19th century, or the Detroit, if you will. This is, of course, Henry Ford's River Rouge plant on an even vaster scale. Right? It's the opposite. It's vast firms employing lots of less educated, many fewer educated, many less educated workers, and of course a great deal of isolation from the world around them because they're occupying these vast vertically integrated firms. It's not that these firms weren't productive, they were wildly productive. But once you put everyone in these vast firms, why the heck did you need to put them in a city? Why did they, they didn't have any connection with the outside place around them? You could move them as Ford did to River Rouge, to a suburb. You could move them to a right to work state. You could move them to a lower cost country. Once you had created these wholly contained factories, you no longer had the fabric of urban connection, of urban interaction that enabled cities to, 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 to come back time and time again. And when you had changes in economic fundamentals, what you're looking at is the cost of moving a ton of mile by rail, which declined by roughly 90% over the course of the 20th century. When it became cheap, to move goods over space, and you no longer needed to be near those rail yards. You no longer needed to be near the Great Lakes. It became so easy to just move the production somewhere else. Now, some places were able to come back, but others, but others were not. And this is what uh, Detroit Dry Dock looks like today. Right? It's a hollowed hull, hull of a building. It still actually was very, in, it was actually an innovative industrial architecture for its time. Now you can walk around it. It's empty and probably unsafe, but it didn't stop me when I was, I was touring this. But it certainly doesn't feel particularly well taken care of. This is, you know, dilapidated industrial buildings or dilapidated buildings in urban decline are not specific to, to my own country. This is um, a, a picture of some dilapidated homes in, in I think, Liverpool. Um, now, a lot of things, uh, the decline of... Um, Cities like Detroit, and New York for that matter, uh, were, were accompanied by a number of large tectonic forces uh, within the US, one of which was declining transportation costs enabled people to free themselves from locating in areas that had a natural productive advantage, like access to the Great Lakes or access to a coal mine. And they increasingly moved to places that had consumption amenities. This was about the rise of the consumer city. Now, apparently, the thing Americans value most, and this is quite puzzling to me, being someone who lives in New England, is warmth. Because there's no variable that better predicts the growth of metropolitan areas in the 20th century than January temperature. Right? And what you're looking at here is the relationship between mean January temperature and population growth 1980 to 2000. Now, a lot of things are rolled up in this, particularly in recent decades, because warmer places also have a very different policy towards uh, housing construction. But there's no question that if you think about the the broad arc of the move to places like Los Angeles, um, 
and later Phoenix and Miami, that actually a lot of it was about a move to consumption amenities because you no longer needed to live in the Great Lakes. And one of the challenges that differentiates America's declining cities from, from England's declining cities is that Detroit is not just facing the hangover of, of an industrial past that left it with lots of empty factories and lots of less well-educated workers. Right, 12% of the, of the city population in Detroit is, has a college degree as opposed to 27.5% in the US as a whole and more than 50% in cities like Seattle. Um, Despite, besides that, you know, and you can make similar, there are similar issues which bedevils many older industrial cities in, in UK, your climate just isn't as variable as ours is. So there's nothing, there's nothing climactic that's so terrible about Manchester the way that there, you know, there's no, the gulf between Manchester and London is just much smaller than the gulf between Detroit and Miami in terms of the, the temperature. Um, now, on top of, of the move to sunshine, the changes in transportation technology also, of course, created a reshaping of urban form. Now, again, there's nothing new to this. Cities have always been built around the transportation technology that was dominant in the era in which they were created. We go back to the oldest part of old cities, and they have the windy pedestrian paths and narrow lanes that are common when people are walking. We see places that are newer that are built around the omnibus, for example. We see more grids. We see larger space. Streetcars and subways allowed further, further sprawl during their decade. And in the 20th century, much of, of America, at least, rebuilt itself around the car. The car, of course, is different from all of the other pre-car other pre forms of transportation because it's it actually point to point. You don't actually have to walk from the rail station or the bus station to your, uh, to your final destination. And as such, it allowed a total reshaping of how cities, cities are formed. What you're looking at at the top there is Levittown, an early car city, mass-produced housing in, in post-war America, providing affordable houses for, for uh, returning veterans. The bottom line is the far more opulent modern development of the woodlands outside of Houston, involving massive uh, homes and, you know, as you can see, abundant trees. Um, the line of the developer was, uh, when, he, when he hired his architect, I've named my place the Woodland and there better be some trees in it by the time you're done. That was the, uh, that was the line. But this move to car-based living and the move to the Sun Belt hit almost all of America's older, colder cities with enormous ferocity. Right? What you're looking at is the 10 largest cities in America as of 1950 and what happened to their population after that. Eight of the 10 lost 20% or more of the population. Three of them lost about 50% or more. Huge declines, right? Cleveland, St. Louis, and, and Detroit are shadows of their former self. The, the economic decline was, of course, also associated with enormous social distress, as is so often the case. And, and this is the, uh, uh, an image of the Detroit riot, where the city itself seemed to be on flame. Cities, of course, you know, we saw sort of Tahrir Square to, 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 to begin with, the sort of upside of, of urban change and, and political unrest. Of course, political unrest and, and uprisings are not always so benign for, for the people living in, in those areas, even though even when cities uh, you know, make, make this sort of thing possible. Um, and Detroit's problems were, of course, not helped by the fact that it invested in structures rather than people coming back. And I think that's a, that's a central message of uh, the book in terms of public policy, that you really want to be careful about thinking that you can fix decline with more building. Right? The hallmark of declining places is that they already have a lot of structures, a lot of homes, a lot of transportation infrastructure relative to people and the state of demand. Detroit didn't need new buildings in the 1950s and 1960s, and it certainly didn't need a people mover monorail in the 1980s to glide over essentially empty streets. Right? You could take a bus perfectly quickly in Detroit. There are not very many cars there. Right? You don't need a monorail to pretend that you're in Disney, Disney World. And yet this is what they did. And I don't fault Detroit's people. The federal government was there, as national governments are so often there, ready to fund transportation, ready to fund rail, but not ready to fund schools, not ready to fund what Detroit actually needed, which was the children of Detroit to actually get educate, decent educations and to have the, sa the safety that, every that should be every child's uh, birthright. Now, if you want to think instead about what, you know, what, what enables cities to come back, it's fundamentally about human capital. It's fundamentally about entrepreneurship relative to, um, relative to, to physical structures. Now, 60 years ago when Ben Chinitz compared New York and Pittsburgh, he talked about New York's resilience, New York's strength having to do with a culture of entrepreneurship that was inculcated by its garment industry. The garment industry in New York, again, a child of its port, was something that had very few barriers to entry. It was something in which lots of small people could get, could get involved and get their start doing entrepreneurial activity. One of the stories I tell in the book is the story of A.E. Lefcourt, who was uh, New York's largest skyscraper builder before the Great Depression. 
Um, he got his start in the garment industry. He got his start, well, actually, he got his sh start shining shoes and selling newspapers. But when he moved beyond that level of proto-entrepreneurship, he moved into the garment trade, and that was his starting point. That was the, and he moved into skyscrapers because he remade uh, central, central Manhattan into the modern garment district, vastly improving the quality of life for the people uh, living there. Left courts, of course, like many builders, um, felt like he had to build until the point of bankruptcy. So he famously declared that 1930 was going to be a great building year. Uh, it wasn't. Um, the, um, but New York manages to come back, and I think one of the, the ways to see New York's comeback is, of course, it's intimately tied to finance, and it's easy today in the, the post-crash you know, post world to think that it would be a nice thing if both London and New York had a few other industries that were as strong as financial services, and I certainly share that, that view. But on, on the other hand, it would be foolish to understate the importance that finance has played to the rebounding of these cities. Um, now, if you think about the sort of chains of invention that cities create, think about a, a chain like, you know, uh, Renaissance painting in Florence, for example. Brunelleschi figures out about low relief perspective. He passes it along to his friend Donatello, who puts it on the wall of uh, Orson Michele in low relief sculpture, who passes it along to his friend Masaccio, who puts it on the Brancacci Chapel, who passes it along to his student, that less than saintly monk, Fra Filippo Lippi, who passes it along to Botticelli and so forth. A chain of genius where one smart person riffs on the next and comes up with something new. Well, I kind of see the same thing in financiers and New York in the 70s. Uh, although, um, so uh, a bunch of smart people in, in Chicago in the 1950s start figuring out how to mathematically trade off risk and return. So this is Jimmy Savage, Milton Friedman, and then passing it along to Harry Markowitz, their student. That then gets passed, embodied in people like Jack Trainer and Fisher Black, who take it to Wall Street. This ability to think more rigorously about risk and return enables the young Michael Milken to sell high-yield debt to a wider spectrum of, of financially uh, savvy investors. That high-yield debt then enables Henry Kravis to engage in larger and larger leverage buyouts and get more value out of American firms. Lou Ranieri of uh, securitization is also part of this chain. And I like the Ranieri story because he reminds us that cities are, are still forges of human capital. He's one of those guys who gets his start in the Solomon Brothers mailroom. So he gets his skills not by being formally trained, but by being able to soak up the knowledge that New York has for him to borrow. And of course, the last example and I'll, I'll, on this is, is Bloomberg. And I like the Bloomberg example for two reasons, one of which is it makes this famous Jane Jacobs point about the strength of cities being in, enabling cross-industry fertilization. He's not a financial fin, financier billionaire, right? He's an IT billionaire. He, in some ways, is competing with the guys of Silicon Valley. But the reason why he's able to succeed in IT is because he's run the trading floor at Solomon Brothers because he then was exiled to doing the technology, technology back office stuff for Solomon Brothers, because he knows in the way that no Silicon Valley mogul could ever know what the customers at Merrill Lynch actually want, what the traders at, at Morgan Stanley actually want. He's able to, he has that knowledge that makes him much more effective as, as an innovator, as an entrepreneur that actually is, again, a gift of the city. I like Bloomberg also because of this thing. This is, of course, the Bloomberg bullpen. He took out the walls in City Hall, which is something that he had done earlier in Bloomberg LLP, and it was itself modeled on a trading floor, on the trading floor that he ran at Solomon Brothers. Now, this thing is in some sense the city writ small. If you think about a trading floor, right, it has some of the wealthiest people on the planet. In a normal industry, they would sit behind vast, you know, vast offices that would be guarded by assistants of various types. They would have all the pleasures of privacy to themselves. But on a trading floor, they're right on top of each other. They're right on top of each other because they value knowledge more than space. Because, in fact, knowing a little bit more is worth putting up with the inconvenience. And that's fundamentally what cities are all about. That's what the modern city does, is that it's a place where people value knowledge more than space. And the success of cities, I think the continuing importance of cities, is basically because I don't see any chance that people are going to start valuing knowledge less in the, in the years to come. And I don't see any way that new technologies are going to eliminate the incredible value of being right there. Right? If you just think about the amount of information that comes from being right there, right, that it would be almost impossible to duplicate that in some sort of an E setting of some, uh, of some form, um, both because of the randomness and because of the ability of face-to-face -face connections to transfer the most complicated ideas. And, and there is a, you know, a huge amount of evidence, that I think, that suggests that in many cases, face-to-face -face contact and electronic technologies are complements rather than substitutes, right? So the book was hardly an enemy to cities. The telephone was hardly an enemy to cities. If you look at actually people who call each other, they're more likely to call each other if they're actually physically close to one another. If you look at actually the most famous example of geographic concentration in the world today is the highest tech industry with the biggest ability to act 
actually connect electronically to Silicon Valley. So I think it's, it's very hard to make a case from the evidence that e-technology e is going to, in any sense, make face-to-face -face contact obsolete. And there's a lot of things which suggest it's going to create a more interactive, more urban world. Um, now, the sideline, if we actually want to understand why some cities like New York were able to come back and other cities weren't, uh, the, the one variable which uh, does better than any other in terms of explaining this stuff is, is percent college graduates at the, at the start of the time period. So what you're looking at it here is across the entire U.S. population, the relationship between metropolitan area growth and share of the population with college degrees in 1970. So this is for the whole U.S. This is for the Northeast and the Midwest. This is for the declining areas. Whole, whole country, Northeast and Midwest, right? 53% growth for the top quintile. Very low growth for, for anybody else. Huge, huge connection between skills and, and subsequent growth. I, I have this for Scotland, too. I don't, know, I don't remember why I have this specifically for Scotland, but it, but it is actually true in Scotland as well. And I think in, in almost, I, I haven't heard of any particular place where, you have, where I haven't seen this. It's also true for India. This is, the, um, this is of course, I think that the thing that underlies it is the fact that the connection between neighborhood skills and your earnings, and your productivity as well, I believe, has, gotten, has gone up over time. So this is a fact associated with Jim Rausch and later Enrico Moretti. But holding your level of skills constant, your wages go up by about 8% as the share of the population in your metropolitan area goes up by about 10%. Um, and this is something that has risen over time. So it's not as if having skilled neighbors is becoming less valuable because of internet, internet connections. It appears to be becoming more valuable over time as, as skills themselves become uh, more valuable. This is the same graph for India, and it's actually an even stronger connection than actually being in, uh, having more skilled neighbors is even stronger there. Um, you also see an increasing connection between skilled industries and, and locating in the center city. Um, and during the recent downturn, area education was the most protective thing across American metropolitan areas, that those skilled metropolitan areas were just much, had much lower unemployment rates. The connection was about 70% stronger than you would predict from the fact that the average unemployment rate for high school dropouts was 15% and the average uh, unemployment rate for college graduates was 5%. Right? This effect was much, much stronger than that, suggesting again these spillovers, the fact that in these dense clusters, and what's Marshall's phrase, the mystery of the trade become no mystery but are as it were in the air, this idea of, of learning from people around you. Uh, second thing, um, which is again about this small firms fact. So this is the relationship between average firm size in 1977 and subsequent employment growth across American metropolitan areas. Um, so a very strong sense in which this is one of the proxies for cultures of entrepreneurship. We have many others. But those places that had smaller average firm sizes grew much more quickly. This is also true within metropolitan areas. And it, it turns out to be an enormously robust fact. I interpret this as saying something again about human capital. It's about a different type of human capital than that that we create, you know, in places like LSE, it's about the, the human capital that the young AE left court got from working in, in the garment industry. Now, the success of cities um, is often associated with a sort of thing that seems strange to non-economists but very natural to economists. So what you're looking at here is Rio de Janeiro. And you're looking at the, uh, you know, the, the beautiful skyscrapers along the beautiful port, this beautiful city. And then that mess down there is the favelas, is the poor areas uh, of Rio. And uh, this is a, a more graphic picture of, of Mumbai's Dharavi slum, right? This is a, a picture of urban poverty. So one of the things that we see in, in our cities is that despite their success, there's a lot of poverty there. And that's often taken to be an indictment of our urban areas. But that's the wrong way to think about it. Cities are, have plenty of poor people, not because they make people poor, but because they attract poor people. Because they have assets which for millennia have attracted people who start with less. The, the opportunity to partner with people who have more entrepreneurship, more skills, more capital, as immigrants have found for, for millennia as they've come to, come to cities. The ability to actually find something that will provide some way out of rural poverty for them. The ability to get around without a car for every adult. So I talk about some of my work with Matthew Kahn in the book, where we find that when in the US, when you build subway stops, poverty rates rise in neighboring areas. Does that mean that subways are actually impoverishing people? Well, maybe the taxpayers, I guess, but certainly not the peop not disproportionately the people who are living near them. C subways are quite naturally attracting people who don't have the means to afford a car for every adult. And that's actually something that's good about subways. It's not something that's bad about subways. In the same sense, the larger urban ability to provide economic opportunity, a social safety net, and so forth, for poorer people is not something to be ashamed of in cities. It's something that actually cities should be proud of. And in fact, there's more problem in the artificial equality of suburban areas than there is in the inequality of, of, of cities. Um, now, 
That's not to say that there aren't severe issues with Dharavi, right? You wander around Dharavi and you see this sort of amazing hub of, you know, of human entrepreneurship, right? In one, in one room, there are a couple of, couple of guys sewing brassiers, and you feel like you're in, back in the Lower East Side of Manhattan in 1905. And in another room, there are people who are sorting through old plastics doing recycling. And then in another room, there are people making these beautiful, intricate pots, all of whom are, are highly energetic. And the place is safe because they're looking out for each other. But then you see a kid defecating in the streets. And then you see the disease problems that are, that are there in the issue. And then you see the unpaved, unpaved areas. And you feel like you're in this terrible combination where you have you know, wonderful private energy and public failure. And that's something that comes out in cities, that an abundance of land hides many sins. But when you bring people together on dense areas, the need for public management grows. The same, if I'm close enough to exchange an idea with you face to face, I'm close enough to give you a contagious disease. Don't, don't worry, Paul, I'm not actually sick. Uh, and if I'm close enough to sell you, sell you a book face to face, I'm probably close enough to rob you as well. And of course, uh, I'm not going to do that either. Um, but the, uh, and of course, putting a lot of cars on the streets is also, is also a great challenge. And that requires management. So this is the, you know, this is the path of, of death rates in the city of, city of New York over the past 200 years. A child born in New York in 1900 could expect to live seven years less than the national average. Okay? Today, life expectancies in New Yorkers is about two years longer than the national average. Similar facts are true for London, right, where historically London was a killing field, a place where there were at least five years of, of life expectancy lost by moving here. Uh, today, among people who are over 60, life expectancies are, are longer in London than in, than in the, rest of, the rest of the UK. That didn't happen by accident, and it wasn't solved by the free market. I mean, as much as, as this talk is a, you know, a, has enormous respect for the ability of urban entrepreneurs to work magic, urban entrepreneurs didn't solve the problem of clean water. That required massive government spending in infrastructure. And one of the stories I tell in the book is how cities reacted to the yellow fever epidemics of the 1790s in the US. Now, Philadelphia followed the public works pattern and did so fairly successfully. This was with Latrobe. New York had a different, uh, had a different pattern. And, and this involved a sort of unholy combination of Aaron Burr and the man that he would eventually kill, Alexander Hamilton. Henry was telling me earlier, no, I won't give you blame for this. Uh, a, a maxim that a friend of mine, who shall remain nameless, had is that, that if people from all stripes of the political background are behind a project, you should probably be pretty worried about it. Now, uh, the people of, of New York should have been pretty worried when Alexander Hamilton and Aaron Burr got together. But Burr had this idea for a private water provision company that would be subsidized by the ability to do banking. Now, banking privileges were rare in the, rare in the U.S., in, in rare New York in, in 1800. They were worth something. Indeed, the only other bank was the Bank of New York, Hamilton's own bank. So he hires Hamilton to convince the Federalist City Council, Burr was not a Federalist, Ham Hamilton was, that if you, they undertook public water provision, this would lead to, quote, unquote, burthensome taxes, language that seems awfully familiar today, right? Um, and instead, you know, the Federalist Council nodded, went along, burthensome taxes, and signed off on this private, you know, subsidized private thing. Burr got his Democratic, Democratic Republican friends in the state legislature to sign off. Now, this creates this subsidized water company. This company is still with us. Its descendant is called J.P. Morgan Chase. It used to be the Chase Manhattan Bank, which used to be the bank of the Manhattan Water Company. Okay? It did a lot of banking. It's been a very successful bank over the past 210 odd years. It didn't do a lot of water. There wasn't a lot of money in providing clean water. There's a lot of money in banking. So they did a marginal amount, but it got, it got very little done. And they're both problems in terms of the information quality about the water and in terms of the externalities involved in the water that during this time period, public water provision just wasn't, just wasn't an option. And you really needed massive infrastructure like the quote and aqueduct to solve this. Um, cities also fix this with, with things like John Snow's famous ghost map of the cholera epidemic in London, where the city proved a laboratory where people actually figured out how to, where Snow figured out where the, the water pump that was responsible for the disease. Um, homicides as well required a large government intervention. Now, uh, while infrastructure was useful in terms of getting rid of water, it's less useful in terms of, of getting rid of highway congestion, right? The, the work of Gilles Duranton and Matthew Turner on the fundamental law of traffic congestion finds that vehicle miles traveled increased roughly one for one with highways built. This means that you can't fundamentally build your way out of congestion, at least not with reasonable, reasonable quantities of building. If you build it, they will drive. You need to actually price roads, and London, of course, was a pioneer in, in doing this. I think, as you can see, I think Singapore does it better uh, this is, you know, one of the densest places on the planet, and yet the, yet the uh, cars are moving quickly. But certainly, you know, America has, in this area, as in many others, uh, a lot to learn from the UK on this. Um, defeating the demons with, come with density then enabled the consumer city to flourish. 
And the same innovations that help New York City's finance, help New York City's restaurants, urban scale of bets specialization. You have the scale economies that enable the museums and the theaters to thrive. And once cities become safe, they become exciting as well as, as, uh, as productive. And one of the things I think that's interesting is that if you go back to the 1970s, living in a city, working in a big metropolitan area, came with a, real, with a huge real wage premium. In, in a sense, people were getting combat pay to live in New York. By 2000, that was gone, okay? Not because New York had become less productive, it was more productive by every measure, but because prices had gone up so much that people were no longer actually, they were in some cases actually even willing to pay a premium for the fun of being in, in New York City. Um, so that's, a, that's a, you know, been part of, uh, of urban success. But the bad thing about that, okay, is that those high prices didn't have to happen. That in fact, if New York had built more, New York would still be more affordable to middle-income people. And the problem with the inequality of New York is not that it's a bad thing that New York isn't a, isn't a good place to be poor or a good place to be very rich. The problem is it's a very hard place to be middle-income. And um, what you're seeing here is, is the decline, and then the declining line shows the declining number of permits in, in Manhattan. The rising line shows rising prices. So just as New York was, was coming back as a city, it permitted less and less building. New condominium buildings, buildings were getting shorter and shorter in the city. Right? We're getting more and more restrictive. Um, and certainly, uh, this is an issue in London as well. This, this just shows the relationship along the, along the x-axis is the amount of new building in the metropolitan area between 2000 and 2005. Along the y-axis is price. Right? Places that are built a lot aren't expensive. Places that are expensive don't build a lot. There also are a bunch of low demand places close to the, uh, close to the origin. And it wouldn't matter what they did to the construction policies. But um, the, the, the choices of land use are incredibly important. And this is actually where Jane Jacobs got it wrong. That uh, this is Jay Jacobs making a fairly, um, uh, I don't know, uh, skeptical look perhaps on the high rise housing behind her. And she wasn't wrong to be skeptical about high rise public housing. It had a bad track record. But she was wrong to be against NYU putting up a nine story library. She was wrong to have a knee jerk opposition to any uh, large scale development in the city or to think that there was one right scale for urban life. And she was particularly wrong when she followed a very strange form of logic based on her ground-level observation of cities, which is she wandered around, she saw that old buildings were cheap and new buildings were expensive. And this led her to conclude that the way to keep New York cheap, or any city cheap, was to make sure nobody built any new buildings on top of old buildings. Okay? Well, that's not how supply and demand works. Okay? If you restrict new building, if you keep densities low, you make things more expensive, not cheaper. As her own old neighborhood, Greenwich Village, makes clear, when she was living there in the 40s and 50s, it was affordable to middle-income people. It's had 40 years of a preservation district that stopped new construction in the area, and now hedge fund managers only need apply for townhouses that start at $5 million. Right? The, the failure to build up, the failure to create more density in attractive areas, creates an, an obvious affordability problem. Uh, and this is certainly something that, you know, uh, there's been a little action in London. This is, of course, your own, uh, your own skyline. Uh, but London, of course, is a, is a city that is famously difficult to build in. And uh, the, the failure to build, when combined with rising demand, um, makes, the, makes the city more and more expensive. Um, and indeed, I think this is, this is something that's very important for, for you know, Great Britain to think through in the years ahead, right? There basically are sort of two strategies for trying to capture the magic of London, right, and to try and deal with these regional disparities, one of which is to expand London more, to, to loosen the restraints that, that uh, stop a, a, uh, a rich city from housing more people, from enabling more people to experience that magic. The other approach is to try and do all sorts of transportation investments to enable people living in outlying areas to access some of it from, from a larger distance. Um, I wouldn't presume to give, give advice on, on, this, on this issue here, but I think certainly the track record of allowing productive cities to grow has historically been better than the track record of trying to use infrastructure to pull back uh, declining, declining regions. Um, the costs of, uh, of extreme limitations on land use planning are even more severe in the developing world. So this is Mumbai, which imported a, uh, a British opposition to uh, building up in the 1960s. It maintained in its central area a floor area ratio cap of 1.25 for many, many years. And this is you know, one of the most productive you know, places in India. This is a place with huge demand. And when you know, London or when New York screws up in terms of land use policy, it's, it's not great, but we'll survive. We're rich places. We'll be all right. When Mumbai screws up, then all of India suffers. 
then the city becomes too sprawling, too dirty, too flat, too uh, problematic, and too, way too expensive, right? This is a, a very poor country, and yet space in Mumbai is as expensive, high-end space, as in any other uh, developing, developing, uh, developed city, as expensive as Singapore, for example. Um, that's a tragedy in some sense, because Mumbai is the, one of the places that's providing a path out of poverty to prosperity for, for India, and holding it back with draconian land use plan planning policies is a big problem. Now, I think one of the reasons that we want to rethink height is sp because of the environment as well. And because, in fact, those skyscrapers can be pretty green. Indeed, high-density living can be pretty green. And I, I want to tell a little story, and I'm just going to end on this, about a young Harvard graduate, that's his picture, who in a beautiful spring day in 1844 went for a walk in the woods outside of Concord, Massachusetts. Um, that's the lake that's near the woods. Now, there hadn't been much rain lately, and that made for good fishing since the, the uh, streams were relatively dry. So they caught fish and they began to cook them into a chowder. Now, the wind flicked the flames to the nearby dry grass and, and the, a fire started and soon the conflagration turned into an inferno and by the time it was done, more than 300 acres of prime conquered woodland had been burned to the ground. Okay? This young man, during his own age, was castigated as an enemy of the environment. The conquered freeman called him a flibberty gibbet, which I think was pretty bad for 1844. Um, <laughs> And it, indeed, they were, uh, I think, right to do so. Right? It's hard to think of someone who you know, lived in Boston or New York who did as much harm to the environment as this, as this young man. Of course, today, he is the secular saint of American environmentalism. His name is Henry David Thoreau. And he, he preached a, a, a gospel of, moving around, uh, of living around the trees. Now, while that may be good for some people's soul, I mean, I, I actually moved uh, about five years ago to, to a treed area not far away from, far away from that, and it, that has yet to do any good for my soul. Uh, but, um, as my wife will tell you, uh, but, um, and, and certainly, uh, like Thoreau, I ended up doing a lot more damage to the environment, which is also a story that's told by David Owen in Green Metropolis. Um, Thoreau, um, Thoreau's old life makes sort of a critical point. We are a destructive species. Okay? It's who we are. We burn things down. We burn oil. We do lots of, we engage in lots of, lots of energy. And in many cases, if you love nature, the best thing to do is to stay away from it for its own good. <laughs> right? That's, in some sense, I think, what Thoreau's message was. And, and while it's nice to think about rural living in, you know, burning the occasional log and taking your mule to town as being very green, uh, that's not actually, you know, when real people live in low-density areas, they don't actually like to live like medieval serfs. Uh, and when they actually live in the way they like to live, uh, you know, high-density living just ends up being a, a lot greener, at least, at least in the metropolitan areas of the U.S. that we've looked at. So this is greenness is measured by carbon emissions within the United, within greater Boston area, and of course the areas where Thoreau and I live are uh, notably red relative to the greener areas in the central downtown. There are two things. This is mainly workplace emissions. Sorry, this is mainly household emissions, both from transportation and within the household. It's mostly about having smaller houses and uh, about shorter commutes, right? Those are the two things that are causing emissions to go down substantially within, within central areas. And, and the reason why I think this matters, why this is in fact important, is not that the U.S. or the U.K. are going to radically m remake our urban landscapes, right? We're going to move a little bit on the margin. It's going to be rounding error. But there are places where great cities are being built overnight. And if places like India and China, this is actually just the, the, a little map of the carbon emissions areas of China, which is another paper that I've done. And, and you know, the key fact is that the, you know, the lowest density American areas from household emissions are more than 10 times the average household emissions in China right now. And even though China is actually the largest carbon emitter on the planet, that's primarily industrial. And they actually don't do a lot of, of household carbon emissions. They don't drive very much still, and they don't, they don't engage in a lot of home cooling. Um, if China and India move up to U.S. carbon emissions levels, global carbon emissions rise by about 127 uh, percent. If they move up to the levels of Hong Kong, you know, also a wealthy place, but a place with far lower carbon emissions aided by its, its high levels of density, global emissions go up by less than 25 percent. So there's a huge, if you're, if you're worried about carbon emissions, or heck, if you're just worried about the price of gas at the pump, I have to say that for American audiences, where there's a, there's a, there's a you know, th this, is, this issue is far more uh, contentious, talking about global warming. But either way, if you're worried about gas at the pump or you're worried about global warming, having China build up rather than out is, uh, is you know, something devoutly to be wished. So um, let me just end by holding up the, holding up the book again. I'm, I'm uh, <laughs> just to remind you that I'm here to, I'm here to sell. Uh, the... Um, the, but uh, I think at some level it's not, it's, I wrote this book not 
particularly because I was trying to convince anyone to, to move to a city who didn't want to live in a city or trying to do anything that, that form. But I really do think that there is a, a hackneyed view of history of cities that is based on you know, things that ceased to be true 50 years ago and that cities are, in fact, in many ways, incredibly dynamic places that, in some sense, play to what is most essential in us as people. Because we are so social, because we gain so much from people around us, in some sense, they make us more human. And as I look towards the future, and uh, you know, despite the many problems that humankind faces, I, I remain enormously optimistic, because I'm enormously optimistic in our collective ability to solve our problems. And, and that, I think, ultimately makes me enormously optimistic about the city. So thank you very much. Happy to stay there? Sure. I'm okay, uh, Ed is uh, going to take some questions. Uh, I think there are microphones floating around. We'll, we'll wait 30 seconds uh, for people who can't wait to, to leave so that uh, things are a bit quieter. Yeah. Uh, sorry. Um, but uh, can we see hands? Uh, remember, remember to buy a book on your way out. Yeah. <laughs> uh, okay, uh, maybe uh, here in the front row, Jonathan. We'll start taking one at a time, and then uh, if, if time's going too fast, I'll start bundling sure. them together. Um, I, I'm, I'm Jonathan Haskell from Imperial College. That was an enormously enjoyable lecture, but do you not think that, do, do you not think that diminishing return sets in at some point? Uh, you know, I think, I think there are certainly costs to city building that are convex. So certainly building, building up is, is uh, you know, I mean, the, the sort of building up technology is, is, has highly convex costs between, let's say, two stories and six. Then it has a long, flat period, and then it, then it has highly convex costs after, fa say, 50 stories. Um, there are, you know, in, in terms of the, the, uh, the data on, let's say, productivity in city size, uh, I'm not going to pull it up. Uh, that looks pretty flat to me. I mean, that looks like a, a constantly growing, growing thing that sort of keeps on, keeps on going up. Um, you know, certainly there are problems that get harder and harder to manage as the city gets bigger. I think that's certainly, that's certainly true. Um, but um, I, I, I don't think there's any sort of a fixed, a fixed number, and I think that they, there are, you know, it's, it's certainly hard for us to sign the convexity or concavity of the agglomeration economies. Certainly that's a very, very hard thing to do. So... I guess on some level, I guess the, the fundamental answer I'm coming down to is no, I don't think that there's, there's, an, there's an obvious final, final point, but it does require more management. And certainly the costs of urban density become particularly obvious in those places that have weak governments like in the developing world. Maybe uh, here I see a uh, hand. And actually, if you, if you could follow Jonathan's admirable example on two dimensions, one, stating who you are, and two, keeping it short, yes. uh, that would be appreciated. Uh, my name is Michael Yates. And... Um, you mentioned in your book about uh, Detroit and Liverpool and other Rust Belt cities that have declined. Because, and um, if you were the mayor of Detroit, for example, what would you do? Would you just in invest a lot of money in education and reducing crime, or what would you, what would well, you do? Given uh, I, I would not, I would not sign off on the light rail system that's currently being proposed for Detroit, which right. I think doesn't make doesn't make a lot of sense. Uh, I would certainly worry about education. I mean, the, 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 the key in Detroit is, it's, again, it's not an issue of money. It's an issue of getting more competition and entrepreneurship in, in, the, in the city, in the, in the education system. And I think this is an interesting, I'm not sure the extent, because I think the results have been different in the UK and in the US on this. But in the US, the results from many of the charter schools have been enormously positive, right? That in, in disadvantaged areas and disadvantaged central cities, um, the, the treatment effects of kids who are randomly allocated into charter schools have been enormously positive. So I would, I would do as much as possible to actually get the city school system out of the provision business and try and get more competition and entrepreneurship into the, into the city schools of Detroit. The more failing the city school system, the more the gains are, obviously, from, from doing that. Although a lot of the, you know, I, I think the common view on charters is a lot of the gains is just longer school hours are, are a big part of its, uh, of its successes. Um, I think Mayor Bing is right to think about shrinking the physical footprint of the city. I think that's a, that's a reasonable thing to do. I mean, you have a, one of the things about Detroit that's sort of interesting is it's very different from the disadvantaged areas of Manhattan that I remember from my youth, where you had sort of a distinctly unsafe feeling as you wandered around. You don't feel unsafe in much of, much of Detroit, right, despite its poverty, because there aren't any people there. So you're wandering around a place that feels like an emptied out moonscape, and um, those areas clearly could be put to some form of better, better use, and I think that's something certainly to think about. Uh, 
I certainly feel strongly about, about the safety issues. Uh, and I would also, I, I was on a, I was doing Detroit, Detroit radio last week and they were talking about the enormous regulatory red tape that a woman who wanted to open up a food truck had to go through. Uh, we have this issue in Boston as well. I, I, I'm part of the free the food truck movement. Uh, it's actually one of those political issues that I feel very passionately about. Uh, <laughs> that America has very strong regulations in many cities against private entrepreneurs opening up food trucks. So I, I think, not particularly the food trucks, but Detroit could, you know, the last thing Detroit needs is any barriers to entrepreneurship, right? There's no entrepreneur that Detroit doesn't, doesn't need. So, you know, that would be another place to work. As far as actual industrial policy, I think it's very, very hard. And Detroit doesn't really have the resources to do that. Um, but more generally, in terms of industrial policy, I think that the, I mean, the bulk of the economic evidence, economic, you know, evidence is weighed against it. I think there are some uh, modest counterexamples, the work on million-dollar plants, for example, uh, that Greenstone and co-authors have done. And I think the track record of Singapore has been productive. The way that I've, I've interpreted that, those things is what, what the successful interventions in terms of industrial policy are doing is they're basically upskilling the inhabitants. They're actually providing enough, enough education for people. And, and I think that provides us with a way of evaluating them because we know that the sort of dollar per job metric is a very hard one to make sense of with standard cost benefit analysis. But if you actually sort of thought about the, you know, investing in industrial policy as being a form of education, then you can evaluate it with what else we know about the cost of other education programs and, you know, at least do something sensible with it. Okay. Um, so can we get the mic in here or maybe and then... If, if afterwards you can go to that, that gent there, but we'll, we'll take this question first. Hi, my name is Liz Dunn, and I'm from the um, Cities Program, and I'm also from Seattle, which you blogged about last week in the New York Times. And um, I'll just maybe frame my question a little bit in terms of Seattle, because I, I think you made some great observations about the power of agglomeration and putting smart minds together, but I don't think any of it had to do with tall buildings. And so my question is, my question is really, does the... <laughs> debate about um, tall cities versus flat cities not sort of oversimplify um, densification as, as a process. And, and I mean, just referring back to Jane Jacobs, I mean, don't you think that her points were more about mediating change than about being against any particular form of of building. Well, I mean, you know, I mean, her, she's got this line about you get to more than 200 people per acre and you're in a danger zone of sterilization and so forth. I mean, I, I, I mean, I, you know, I've reread those chapters over and over again, and I really feel that, that Jacobs had a particular vision of what urban life was like. It was a vision that was very close to her own home area of Greenwich Village, and that that was what she was rooting for. I mean, I, I can't find anything that sort of, you know, roots for, you know, has has a let's say just a strong respect for the fact that different, you know, there's a, there's a value to having different density levels. I mean, I, I can't tell you how, I mean, my views on density are not that I think that everyone should live in a skyscraper. I just think that there should be the freedom to build up if there's demand for it. I mean, it's, it's, it's not an issue of, of you know, even, even taking into account, you know, if you think there are externalities, and let's price them. Let's not have a, a, some sort of a knee-jerk thing that we prevent all, all change. Um, so in terms of the, the tall buildings issue, I agree with you. I don't think, I, I don't, uh, and I regret the fact that it's kind of, I mean, I, I think it's actually a, a, a good part of Seattle. Seattle has, does have this sort of dense, dense, small core that I think felt very vibrant. I was, I was actually walking around that core while I wrote that, so I may have been overly swayed by the, by the drama of the moment. But there's no question. I mean, Seattle's about education. It's about, a, about the, the industries that are in the area. That's the sort of long-run long run success. Absolutely, it's about Im it's absolutely it's about immigrants. I mean, connections to the you know smart people, small firms, connections to the outside world, and two of those two of those things Seattle had in, in the, the small firms were less so. Although the growth then came from entrepreneurs like like Starbucks, like um, Amazon, and so forth. Um, but density is not you know high de density is not supposed to be a magic bullet that fixes everything. It's a response to demand for an area. Right? It's, not that it's, it's, it's not that you look at an area that's failing and you say, boy, what this area needs is a skyscraper. Just put down the rent center in Detroit. That's going to fix everything. That's the last thing that I want anyone to take away from what I'm, what I'm saying. What density is a, is a solution for is when there's a high degree of demand for an area. When apartments are going for hundreds and hundreds of thousands of pounds, then density provides a means of accommodating, uh, accommodating that demand. It's not a, it's not a, a trick. It's not a, it's not a strategy for urban rebirth. It's just a way of accommodating, uh, accommodating demand and making sure that cities don't become uh, boutique towns that are available only to you know, financial services millionaires. 
mean, if you think about the difference between New York and Chicago, Chicago remains a much more middle-income city because Mayor Daley has unleashed the cranes on Lake Michigan. And it's not that that has, you know, magically made uh, Chicago more productive, but it has made sure that Chicago has stayed more affordable. And that's, that's in some sense what it's, what that's, that, that at least I see that as, as achieving. I'll take one from this side and then, and then I'll, I'll balance things up by coming that side. I know that people always feel hugely affronted if their side of the lecture theatre has any questions. Um, hello, um, I'm Dan Nassimala from government department here. And um, cosmopolitanism is kind of a, a two-edged word around, around this uh, campus right now, but it seems like one of the problems that we've seen specifically in London and New York is we see a sort of a decline of cosmopolitanism in the creation of a kind of enclave economy of financial services that doesn't really have much um, kind of positive externalities. I mean, you, you mentioned they were, but um, so far you've given us kind of how uh, Bloom's, Bloomberg's City Hall looks like. Um, and it, it just seems to me that um, cities like San Francisco, cities like Seattle, uh, where there's a, a, a huge range in a huge mix of different uh, kinds of very highly productive activities um, may provide for a model that's more sustainable and more kind of range of income. Um, <laughs> um, so uh, let's let's just remember remember to start on this. So so I, I'm sympathetic to certain elements of this of this this. Uh, common. But the fundamental problem is there is no industry that has higher returns to having a little bit of more information than finance. There's no industry where knowing a little bit more is worth more. And as a result, those, you know, finance locates in the biggest cities, right? It has just enormous, it's the place where people are willing to forego uh, space for knowledge modes. I do think that both New York and London would be healthier if there were other industries that grew up alongside them. On the other hand, I think having less finance in New York, meaning you know, if, if New York and London hadn't had financial success, they would be in a heck of a lot worse shape. Right? It's, those, it's those dollars that pay for the retail sector, that pay for local government taxes in, in New York and so forth, that provide the philanthropy that enabled Jeffrey Canada's Harlem Children's Zone to operate. You know, it's not as if you'd be better off if somehow or other these places were poor and didn't have the financial services firms. But I agree with you that it would be nice to have uh, nice to have more new industries, nice to have other industries giving in its place. Now, I don't think the track record of New York going in and you know, taxing finance and trying to subsidize other industries is particularly promising. I think that's, that's likely to be, a, to be a mistake. I do think the natural track record is to make sure that you're enabling the production of enough new space for new commercial activities to, you know, and I, I think Jane Jacobs had it exactly right in what she wanted, which, which was you know, cheap space for new entrepreneurs. That couldn't be more correct. The problem is that you don't get that cheap space by engaging in preservationism. That's the, it's the opposite of what you want to do. Um, so I think that's, that's at least one natural, uh, one natural uh, response to that. So, um, uh, and I, I certainly hope that this is not the long-run outcome, that you just end up being dominated by, uh, by, a, single, by a single industry. But uh, it's better, you, the cities are better off than not having those industries, I guess. But it would be better if they had a more balanced industrial portfolio, surely. Thanks. Uh, uh, there's another mic here, maybe. Yep, uh, this, this lady here, and then uh, this gent further along. Thanks. The, um, the pictures I've seen of Detroit recently made, made me think, actually, it is a kind of hotbed of innovation, but of a very different kind from that that you've been talking about. It appears that, they, uh, that the cities recognize the value of multifunctional green infrastructure in a very big way, um, and, and by investing in that and making it look a very different city from a lot of the others in the States, it's attracting um, younger people, it's attracting artistic people, and it's actually improving quality of life really quite quickly um, and probably going to generate um, uh, quite a, a demand in terms of creative industry, for instance. I wondered if that might be a way forward for some of the other shrinking cities. I hope that you're right. Uh, I mean, it certainly wasn't... I mean, I, I, I found... Uh, so I was there in January. That was the... Um, and I certainly felt hopeful. I felt hopeful actually more because I visited a charter school in the, in the old building where Harley Early used to design those famous GM cars in the 30s and 40s. They actually now have a... They, they have a, a school of industrial design that actually runs a charter school. I felt hopeful because of the kids there. Um, I, I haven't seen that much in the straight economic data or in the census data that suggests some significant change in terms of the demographic of the city. I, I haven't seen anything. I mean, I've seen articles 
that have seen you know upbeat articles about Detroit. I haven't seen anything that suggests the sort of large scale change that you that you suggest. And I, I think it's if it were possible, it would be certainly a very different different model than I than one I unfortunately carry in my my head about how how slow cities are to change. That in fact it, it's it's not. I and mean, again, I'm not pushing back against the ideas of green infrastructure. I think it's great that they're experimenting in, in that. But it's it's you know everything that I know about declining cities suggests that it's enormously difficult to get them to train to change their trajectory. But I, I think the basic thrust of your idea, which is that cities like Detroit and, and Cleveland and St. Louis should be open to all sorts of new ideas and all sorts of ideas that are attractive to young uh, entrepreneurial people, is absolutely right. So I certainly I certainly agree with the spirit of your claim. I, I just. Um, I hope I hope that your I hope that your optimism is, is right. That, let me just phrase that because I, I like every you know I am certainly rooting for Detroit. Okay, and then this gentleman. Hi there, I'm an international relations student here at the LSE. Uh, I have a question which may fall outside your area of research or interest, but um, do you see cities performing a role in shaping political political discourse in international relations? Well, they. they Cities have been enormous shapers of political change, you know, since Athenian democracy, since the Iraqis organized the people of Rome, since you know a butcher and a weaver in Bruges challenged the, the French soldiers in the in the uh, Bruges Matins, the the since John Hancock and Sam Adams got together, were connected by Boston's density to uh, you know John Hancock, a man who wanted to change uh, in English commercial policy for his own reasons and needed a crowd to do it. Uh, Sam Adams, like many purveyors of liquor, a man who knew how to conjure a crowd. Uh, right? I mean, these are, these are this ability of cities to affect change. You know, Paris, 1789, Saint Petersburg, 1917, Cairo, 2011. Right? I mean, cities have just this enormous ability to to affect change. Now, part of the issue, which is certainly we experience in Cairo today, is they're agents of change, they, but they're not always great at directing it. Right? So it's it's uh, you know they they can topple a monarch, they can create the con connections that actually empower uh, an urban group. But they don't act necessarily lead towards wise institutions at the end of the day. So I, I guess um, you know I, I certainly believe that in the in the places that are not stable, well-functioning democracies, cities have an outsized role to play in, in the years ahead. I, I hope that it's by and large quite positive, but it's also, of course, dangerous because any time you have large-scale change, uh, it is danger as well. But I'm, I'm certainly rooting for I'm rooting for Stadler Mark Fry any any place I can. So. Okay, let's try and get the stewards a bit fitter so by heading towards the back. Uh, this, this, <laughs> this, there's two, two sort of in a row. Maybe we can do the one in front first and then just pass the mic back after. Uh, Tom Aldridge, Government, Economist, uh, Government Economic Service. Um, the UK has tried quite hard in the last 10 years, uh, at least the last 10 years, to promote dense settlements. To promote what? Uh, um, it's not clear if this is responding to, to demand, if anything. Like dense settlements. Uh, yeah. Uh, if anything, it, look, it, it looks like um, demand is probably to build out. Um, I was wondering if you think we're policies on the right track. Is, um, should we be building up in the UK as well? You know, I think, the, I think the biggest UK issue is the barriers to building. I think that's the, I'm looking at you, Paul. Uh, I, I, I'm, uh, the, I mean, I think that's the, that's the biggest, the biggest issue is, is in terms of making it very, very difficult to build where, where people actually have demand. Uh, I think this combination, and I'm not speaking about the UK for, for right now, because I'm not, I, I don't consider myself expert enough to talk about, I mean, I know something about the barriers to building. I don't know so much about the densification strategies. Uh, I think that the traditional combination of on one side, you know, making it difficult for the free market to deliver with regulation or with things like rent control, for example, and then coupling it with public subsidy on the other side is sort of a super wasteful jujitsu, at least as practiced in, in, the, in, in, in the U.S., that's sort of, you know, deeply suboptimal relative to actually allowing the, you know, developers to do their job subject to a reasonable set of, of regulations. Um, but I'm not going to take a particular stand on these policies because I, I don't know enough about them to, um, to, to say anything. But... And I think there was a question just behind. Yep. I'm Jens uh, Frolikolt. I'm from Economic History Department. Um, question, you mentioned congestion charging, uh, and that's what we have in London. And I think other cities, I think maybe Singapore, have a system where you use the license plate to determine if you can drive or not. And as an economist, what do you think is the most fair thing to do, to have a congestion charge? The license to, to do... To, to, to drive. Does that mean you can drive every other day with your car? 
depending on how on which number your license plate ends. So it's like a rationing no, system those are, those for driving. Are, I mean, uh, uh, Singapore Singapore may have had that once. They don't they don't have that. They do have they do have a high straight car tax. But but these these you're right though. These policies do exist. Various. I mean, Chile followed this policy at one at one point in time. No, I think those are those are those rationing devices are quite wasteful. Right. They end up having having many families buy multiple cars so they can have the the two sides of it. You know, we're we're economists, right? And, you know, the the. We believe in not running Soviet-style transport policies, or at least I do, right? You know, you can't, you can't, you know, in the Soviet Union, they used to allocate groceries by having prices way below the market rates, and then they'd have long lines and stockouts. Well, that's how we allocate highway space, right? We, we charge, you know, we charge to, at least we do, meaning Americans. You, you apparently charge prices now. But, you know, we, we, we charge, you know, we give away highway space to free, and then we get long lines and stockouts, meaning that you can't actually get to the place that you want to get to. Um, you know, the, the, I mean, uh, in the U.S., I'd say something like, you know, the right to drive freely on every road was not written into the, you know, the, into the Constitution. Uh, and there's, you know, there's absolutely no way to solve this problem without pricing, without pricing it. I, I think these quantity, the quantity things are a mistake. And I think one of the nice things is that the, um, this is an area in which economic efficiency and equity can actually go together, which is, I mean, you know, presumably Ken Livingston wasn't in favor of congestion pricing because he thought it would be good for rich people. Right. The, that's that's not at least what I know about Ken's political uh, political agenda. That's that's uh, Mayor Livingston's political agenda. Um, you know, because they, because you get the you get the buses moving more quickly as a result of clearing the clearing the streets, and that's that's something that helps. You know, that's both fair and and efficient. So, I see a lot to I see a lot to like in pricing uh, in pricing of roads. Okay, there was one here. But I would say maybe we could just get a show of hands of people who are desperate to ask questions. So I've got some feeling of how many we've got left. All right, fine. If you're saying we should, oh, let me <coughs> introduce myself. I did urbanization and development here and now doing a PhD at UCL. If you say we should embrace uh, urbanization as a process to have a better, more sustainable future and also let our cities become more dense, I wonder what your uh, opinion about Dubai and the process of Dubaiization is. If you say the price mechanism is a good way of letting things happen and now we look at Dubai, especially after the boom is over, we have lots of empty buildings just because it was a speculation that was working back then. But Dubai, Dubai was not a private developer issue. Now, now private developers often overbuild because they had to take way less for it. It's just illustrating. There, there are plenty of private developers who have built the So can you can you get up to that guy there with the glasses? Sorry to get you. Um, my name is Hao Yu Niu from Social Policy Department, and uh, my question is, um, how um, how can the city make 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 the poor, especially those living in slums, become rich and smart? How can the city make the poor rich and smart? Yes. Okay. <laughs> 
Just. So, so the, uh, <laughs> so for example, so if you think about sort of the data that underlies this plan, so when you look at um, the urban wage you know, at the extra earnings that people get in the city, what you see is that when people come to cities, they don't get all that wage when at once. They don't see their wages leap up the 30% or so that, that's the gap between working in a metropolitan area in a big city versus not being in a metropolitan area. What you see is that over time, you have a faster rate of wage of gain accumulating. So you see a faster rate of wage gain, which I think at times, at least the natural way of interpreting that is that what you're seeing is you're seeing new capital accumulation in the city. And plus, when people leave cities after they uh, after a while, they typically take those wage gains with them. Now, those gains are faster uh, in more skilled cities uh, than in less skilled cities. And I think, again, has at least an interpretation as being skilled accumulation being you know, smarter. The anecdotes in the, in the book, of course, these stories, the story of you know, Lewis Sullivan, of Daniel Burnham, starting work in, in William LeBaron and Jenny's office in, in post-Civil War, post War Chicago, or Lou Ranieri working in the, in the Solomon Brothers Mill. So those are very tangible examples. I mean, it's obvious that Lou Ranieri got smart at least along one dimension from being there, because he sure as heck didn't know anything before he went into the, into the mailroom, and he came out able to be the father of a great industry, one that admittedly is a little suspect at this point. But still, uh, you certainly learn something, uh, whether or not it. Uh, um, and um, in terms of the the, the the point about so I mean, you know, the richer and the, the smarter thing, I think are, are both going together. And it's it's this combination of life experiences and learning from people around you and accumulating uh, accumulating skills. And I tell the story in the book of, of a guy called Ruben Buchan, who's a you know young software entrepreneur in in Bangalore. And you know he's one of the thousands of guys who comes to the city from uh, less less privileged area of India. He acquires some skills, he works at Yahoo and gets started, and he you know goes out on his own, and starts his own company. He's not a he's not a billionaire. He's not you know carrying out Murthy or or uh, uh, one of these guys, but he's he's a very successful young guy who's really acquired the skills that the city the city has given. And I think that's the that's the promise of this. That you know even the, the city has to create this possibility of becoming Okay, let's, uh, in, in the spirit of the book, let's, let's take a final round of questions, sure, and, then, and then Ed, Ed can on, choose. Sorry, no, I want each person to learn from the question before this. <laughs> <laughs> and then, and then Ed, Ed can choose which ones to interact with, which seems to me uh, completely, completely in keeping. So there's two up there, those two could go together. And then, if meanwhile, you could get the mic down here to, to that one, that one, and then uh, we'll see where we stand. Sorry, the, 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 could you just keep your hands up if you're down the front? So here's the, here's, there's this one here, yeah, this guy. Where are we beginning? No, this one, f further around, further around. So the, we haven't had anyone from the Where middle yet. Okay, so the you two first, uh, mm -hmm. then this guy here, and then we'll okay. Okay. see where we're at. Okay. Hi, um, my name's Saeed Ahmed, I'm an energy policy analyst. Just a very quick question about uh, the devolution of power. Um, ah. Is your faith in the future of cities reflected in your faith in city politicians, and if so, do you believe that there should be a greater devolution of power in terms of uh, politicians being able to um, reflect the changes that they want in cities to achieve the goals that they'd like? Thank you. Great. Good question. I'm Nikki Gavron. I lead on planning and housing for the London Assembly. I'm elected politician. And I want to ask you what your vision is for uh, low-income housing the housing that houses the bus drivers, the, the, the dentist, the, no, not the dentist, sorry. <laughs> not the dentist, sorry. <laughs> sorry, not the dentist. <laughs> They're doing fine. Okay. The, the, the bus drivers and the, and the shop workers and sure. the nurses and so on. The key workers that keep, keep a dense urban city going. And I want to know what your solutions are, your vision is, for how you house people on low incomes, essential workers for a city. Okay, excellent. And then let's take one more, just along. Hi, my name is Jamie Hodge. I work in Regeneration. Um, my question relates to feeding the cities. Um, you argue for intensification, densification. I'm interested in where you stand in terms of urban agriculture, um, that, that kind of sustainable agriculture. Uh, when it comes to things like the oil shocks or even looking at Japan just now where many of the cities are finding it very difficult to get food into the cities in times of chaos or natural disaster. So 
uh, I'd like to hear from what the economist in you thinks about uh, the potential of sustainable agriculture. Great. Okay. Three, three great questions. Unfortunately, I cannot possibly figure out a way to tie three of them, <laughs> three of them together. Um, let me start with the vision for uh, affordable housing for ordinary people, uh, in a sense. Um, I think, by and large, it's a mistake to differentiate affordable housing from housing as a whole. I mean, there's, there's one housing market in the city, that there's connections between all those housing markets. And the right way to sort of, you want to keep housing writ large affordable in the city, and that means supply. Now, having supply in a, in a city like London, uh, allowing more supply, will make the city cheaper. It won't necessarily deliver enough affordable housing for that will keep prices low enough for the people that you're talking about. Um, and that's, that's something that we need to admit, right? That actually building up is always going to be more expensive than building out. And even if you have this sort of uh, supply shock, which will then alleviate some of the demand for lower quality housing elsewhere in the city and free that up, I don't think it'll go all the way. And I think if you feel strongly about this, and I think there are lots of reasons to, you need to then couple the supply side policies with the housing voucher program. You need to actually provide housing assistance for lower or middle income people to actually help them, help them uh, rent or buy more. You can't count on supply on its own. But I think it's a mistake to sort of you know, uh, handle supply separately and to think we're going to just create particular affordable housing, particularly if that ends up leading towards segregated housing for those people with less, less resources. That's a very dangerous thing. And I think that the sort of combination of having, you know, uh, limiting, limiting the, the restrictions on supply with a, a humane policy that actually allows people to choose the housing that works for them is, I think, the best, uh, the best combination on this. Uh, in terms of devolution, well, this, is a, this is a great question. I hate the fact that I'm, I'm going to need to give a nuanced answer to it. Uh, because, I, you know, as much as I would like to just say that there's a right answer on this, unfortunately, I don't think so. If we're talking about Mumbai and Maharashtra, okay, I'm there. Mumbai needs to be free. I mean, Maharashtra is a, is a disaster over overfitting Mumbai. It, needs, it just needs, it needs uh, more, more control. And in some sense, the way to think about this, decisions like that are particularly obvious when the quality level at the higher level of government is substantially worse than the quality of the right to protect the city. When the national, when the lower, when the higher level of government is playing multiple political problems, when they have the, the Maharashtra state government is a big problem. Uh, and it doesn't allow the sort of innovation and novelty that would come from, uh, I think, from a, from a more urban design, which you actually see in Delhi, right? Delhi has its own, has its own city government. It's, it's considered to be widely more, more effective. Um, in terms of sort of the broad message, I, I think I'm, you know, I'm in favor of competition among localities, as I am among, among firms, and I think devolution is by and large a helpful thing. Now, it's not universal, though. Let me push back a little. So there are times where we would think that the city government would be a substantially low quality level than the state or national governments, either because the city is you know, particularly lacking in, in people who would be likely to serve it, or just because their economies of scale are doing this at a higher level. That, that's, a, that's a nuance. There are also particular things that governments do that you can't count on localities to do. Localities aren't going to redistribute in any kind of sensible manner. But if a locality tries to run its own social safety net, you know, based on its own taxes at the local level, rich people and firms just flee, right? And this is a, this is a, a reason why you actually need whatever you're doing in terms of redistribution and in terms of taking care of the poor people in the country, you need to do this at a larger scale. You can't handle this, uh, handle this locally. So I think it just isn't a, you know, there, there isn't a right, a, a universal right answer. Um, but certainly in many cases, the, the particularly in, in Indian cities, <coughs> Last question was about urban food. Um, you know, it's the, the, the food problem in Tokyo doesn't feel to me like the primary problem I have. Uh, and certainly the, the food security issues are things that people worry about. I think it's right to worry about it. But it's unlikely to be the case that large-scale urban agriculture is going to be the solution to, to food security problems. In part because the, the you know, that's more an issue of storage than it is of actually growing the food locally. Right? And you only get the food off the, off the plants at certain regular points in time, so it's not necessarily going to be there to get the, get the disruption of your supply. But I think thinking through food security sensibly is, is correct, but thinking that you're going to get a meaningful solution to that out of urban agriculture, I think, at least to me, it's, it's hard to see how that works. I see the case for urban agriculture as being one about just the enjoyment of the people who have it. Right? I don't see it as actually like solving the fundamental problem. I think it's unlikely to be efficient. And from an energy perspective, it's likely to be counterproductive because putting lots of space between people means you have people moving around more, and that involves more energy use than actually moving wheat more. You can move wheat with a lot less energy than you can move people.
people. Now, I mean, people really, you know, people really want to see some plants outside there, and I know certainly lots of people in Cambridge who love a shared communal garden. God bless them. That's not, there's nothing wrong with that. That's a, that's a perfectly good thing. And, you know, there is a, um, I just finished chairing the, uh, the Citizens Committee for the Future of Boston report, and we certainly thought that there were, there were good things in terms of having, having a little bit of urban gardens that's teaching tools to, you know, educate kids and stuff, and that's, that's fine. Um, uh, but it's, you know, it, it's, it's, uh, it, it, you shouldn't think of it as being a solution to an agriculture problem. You should be, think of it as, a, as something that people want in terms of the enjoyment of their, of their everyday spaces. It certainly is a perfectly reasonable thing to think about cities like Detroit where you're downsizing space and you've got to replace um, formerly occupied buildings with something more attractive. So I consider myself friendly to urban agriculture. I just don't think it should be oversold as being a solution to the agriculture problem. It's a, it's a potential ingredient to making a city interesting and fun. That's, that's fine. Um, so I think that's, yeah, I think that's all I have to say about the farms. Okay. Secretary of Agriculture of the U.S. attacked me this week, so I'm, I'm feeling very good about that. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, so. That's, it. that's it. probably another of my maxims. <laughs> um, uh, I think we better uh, draw things uh, to a close there. Um, Ed is, is going to be signing copies of his book, uh, available for purchase outside. Uh, for those of you that, that haven't managed to get your question answered, there's, uh, there's an opportunity for you to, although uh, the second half of the evening may not be as free as the uh, first part. Uh, and it just remains to thank Ed again for a fantastic talk. <laughs>